that people can just come in as they are able. All right, let's pray together. Dear God, thank you once again for this great opportunity to speak to you together. Lord of the universe, Father of our Savior, Jesus Christ, uh, the one who is the Alpha and the Omega. Uh, we can't begin to say enough about you, but we are grateful for you and your love. We ask that you will bless our time together uh, as we um, want to understand and apply your word more faithfully. In the name of your son, amen. amen. Two weeks ago, it was, we looked at some specific relationships within the church. And so Colossians chapter 3, please turn to that. Colossians 3, starting at verse 18. We have these three pairs of relationships. Wives and husbands, children and parents, and employees. Slaves, they're called here, slaves and their earthly masters. So I'd like to revisit some of the comments I made to present a more accurate interpretation of the concept of submission. All right, let's uh, read the passage, Colossians 3, 18 through 4, verse 1, and then we'll take it from there. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything, and do it not only when their eye is on you and to win their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, as working for the Lord, not for men, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for his wrong, and there is no favoritism. Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair, because you know that you also have a master in heaven. All right, we began with Colossians 3.18. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. In getting at its meaning, I made reference to the parallel passage in Ephesians. Uh, you may want to turn to that passage. We're going to be alternating this morning between the Colossians and the Ephesians passages. So this is Ephesians 5. Verse 21 and 22. <clears throat> submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. And I went on to say uh, several weeks ago, the passage in Ephesians 5, 21 teaches a mutual submission as the context for all relationships. So again, chapter 5 of Ephesians, verse 21, submit to one another. Everybody is to uh, recognize this principle of submission to one another out of reverence for Christ. All right, a closer look at the words of the original language, Greek, suggests the following paraphrase of Ephesians 5.21. Be subject to others in the church who are in positions of authority over you. All right. So this defines it a little more 
specifically. Everyone is to be in submission to one another, but then especially uh, we are to be in submission to those who are in authority. Uh, some examples, you don't need to look unless you wish to. Luke chapter um, 2, verse 51. This is the conclusion of that famous time that Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem after the uh, celebration had taken place, the festival. Instead of going back with cousins, aunts, uncles, parents, uh, back up north from Jerusalem up to Nazareth, uh, he stayed there in Jerusalem, and it took a while for his parents, it was a large uh, extended family that was traveling together, no doubt. It took a while for them to figure out, uh, oh, uh, our boy is missing. And so they went back. And uh, here are some of the things that are said. Chapter 2 of Luke, verse 51. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and with man. All right, so there is this matter of Jesus being obedient to them, to his parents. All right, uh, the question comes. There are other passages, Romans 13, 1, if you're taking notes, and 1 Peter 3, verse 22, that uh, contain this verb that uh, is translated submit. All right, uh, the question comes, does the requirement that the wife submit to the husband's authority in any way suggest inferiority? Quickly and loudly, I want to say no. Um, what passage is it that uh, Paul uh, writes to another church, Galatia, big hint there. Uh, what is the passage, you remember, that says that every category of humanity, national, social, gender-wise, all these different categories of humanity uh, uh, demonstrate that in God's eyes, they're all equal. Nobody is superior. Now, the fact that there are different roles in the marriage relationship as well as in parenting or in the workplace, that fact in no way suggests inferiority or superiority. And, and this is a suggestion. It's, it's not a fiat. It's not uh, something other than something to think about. But the fact that there are different roles in the marriage relationship uh, can be understood as um, different remedies for faults resulting from the fall of mankind. So the woman was insubordinate, reflecting an envy of her husband's authority. Genesis chapter 3, uh, verse 16, makes this clear. To the woman, God said, I will greatly increase your pains and childbearing bearing. With pain you will give birth to children, and then this, your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. So that seems to go to the woman's need after the fall, Eve's need, uh, for some kind of parameter, some kind of strong uh, encouragement uh, for her to truly uh, submit to her husband's being head of the family. More about that in a moment. Uh, but it's, it's Galatians 3.28 that is the reference there, where every category of humanity is of equal value. 
Um, and so the woman uh, in Genesis 3.16, tending to um, be desirous, and the word there, desire, um, really goes to the idea of wanting to be like. And uh, that's just not simply to be. Uh, she, uh, in her role, is to submit and honor rather than dishonor her husbands. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. And the husband, uh, on his part, he failed to love his wife in that fateful uh, development there in the garden with the serpent. He failed to love his wife. In what way? He was to protect her as God protect his people. <clears throat> as God promised to protect Abraham and all those uh, who followed as uh, the children of God. Uh, the husband was to have uh, said to Eve, no, uh, that's wrong. It's not for us to take part in. Uh, instead of that, he went right along uh, with her. Genesis 3, verse 6 says, when the, woman, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. No help there for her. Just went right along with it. Uh, confirming her wrong decision. And so his role, uh, subsequent to this fall, is to love his wife sacrificially. That's what the meaning of love is in the passage in Colossians and also in Ephesians, um, where... It says, husbands, love your wives. Do not be harsh with them. The word love there, as we pointed out before, is the word in the Greek agape, which is the highest and the most profound uh, of, of loves. It's, it's something much uh, more, uh, what shall I say, um, much more all-embracing than the word filio, um, from which we have the word Philadelphia. Uh, filio, filio in, in the Greek is a friendship kind of love. And, uh, and then, of course, agape is also uh, much more profound than uh, even eros, erotic love. Uh, so husbands, love your wives, agape your wives, and do not be harsh with them. Again, different roles in marriage can be seen as God's gracious guidelines for imperfect believers as they seek to navigate the shoals of marriage. So God, there, back in the garden, and then confirmed again all these Centuries later, in Paul's letter to the Colossians and his letter to Ephesians, confirms this matter of uh, needing to love at this deeper level because uh, the tendency is not to love that way. So uh, the parallel passage in Ephesians makes explicit what is implicit in the Colossian passage. Um, so, if you would turn to Ephesians 5.23, we'll linger a little bit over this passage, Ephesians 5.23, uh, husband, for the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the savior. So how then is the husband to imitate Christ 
in his seeking to be the head uh, of his wife. What does that imply? Well, it's agape love, as we said, which is the most profound understanding of Christian love. Agape love is sacrificial love in the first place. And this was most profoundly demonstrated by Christ in dying on the cross for sins committed by others. The husband is to be ready to sacrifice time for the good of his wife. The husband is to be ready to place his wife's interests above his own. The husband is to be willing even to die if it would benefit his wife. So this is all included in the kind of love that Christ demonstrated uh, in his time on earth. Agape love is sacrificial love. Agape love is a purifying love. Uh, look at this passage again. Verse 27. Uh, or Let's go to 26. Uh, husband, love your wife as Christ loved the church to make her holy, cleansing her by the washings with water and the word. That's probably a reference to water baptism there. Uh, but through these symbols uh, of the sacrament, and then through the actual word of God, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. And then verse 27, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. So... Here is this purifying love concept, the application of his righteousness to believers uh, through the work of the Holy Spirit, transforming the believer to be more and more like himself. So here is uh, William Barclay and his comments about the husband's treatment of his wife. Quote, any love which drags a person down is a false love. Any love which coarsens instead of refining the character, <clears throat> excuse me, any love which necessitates deceit, any love which weakens the moral fiber, any love from which a person emerges a worse person is not love. Okay. Agape is not only uh, uh, a purifying love, but it's also a caring love. Ephesians 5, verse 25, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. That is uh, a remarkable invitation to husbands, isn't it? <clears throat> you are to love your wife as Christ loved the church. And he loved the church to present her to himself, pure and holy, as we just saw. This agape love is one which nourishes and cherishes the wife, just as any person will nourish and cherish his or her own body. Paul says in this passage that the husband is to love his wife as their own bodies, after all, Paul wrote, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it. Well, uh, that's a general statement. There are people who neglect their bodies, sometimes even injure their bodies. I'm told that cutting is a, a phenomenon among teenagers that is uh, on the increase. Uh, this um, we would say sickened, but certainly sinful, uh, pathetic, uh, ill treatment of one's own body. That's not the way it's intended to be. So Paul is to love his wife as their own bodies. After all, 
No one ever hated his own body, but feeds it and cares for it. Uh, Barclay comments, he must regard his wife not as a permanent servant, but as the one person whom it is his duty to cherish. And then goes on to say, there is something wrong when a man regards his wife consciously or unconsciously as the one who cooks his meals and washes his clothes, cleans his house and trains his children and nothing more. So he is to cherish and care for his wife. Finally, agape love is an unbreakable love. <clears throat> A quote here from Genesis 2.24, for the sake of this love, a man leaves father and mother and cleaves to his wife. He no more must think of separating from her than he would think of tearing his own body apart. The marriage vows calls for loving and cherishing one another until death do us part. None of us have perfectly kept this directive but the Holy Spirit helps us to grow in obeying if we're will, willing for that. Now, when it comes to children, Colossians 3, turn back, please, to our letter. Colossians 3, verses 20 and 21. Children, obey your parents in everything. Why? Because this pleases the Lord pleases parents too, but primarily the focus is on the Lord in all of this. Children, obey your parents and everything, for this pleases the Lord. And uh, I'd like us to notice that the command to children is to obey in the NIV translation here. Wives and husbands, um, wives submit, children obey. All right. Um, the word translated obey is only applied to children and masters, never to wives. Okay. To put this matter of the differing roles simply, wives are to submit to their husbands as the church submits to Christ. So it's not something weird, this submission. It's the way we are to be as believers, the way the church is to be with Christ all the time. Wives are to submit. Husbands are to love their wives, even as Christ loved the church. Uh, Pretty remarkable love, isn't it? Now, as we draw nearer to the end of the letter to the Colossians, we find Paul commending prayer. So we're moving away now from these basic relationships. We could say much more uh, about the child and the parent and the uh, master and the slave. Uh, today, the equivalent of the slave-master relationship, roughly, would be that of employee to employer. But it's clearly the workplace that's in view there. Um, so after uh, thinking a little bit, at least, about these relationships, especially the husband-wife relationship, which is so basic and the structure of the family is so uh, crucial for the health and well-being of any society, uh, a, a structure that has come in for uh, much abuse, the husband-wife relationship. And so there has been a strong, if you put it that way, deterioration uh, of the family in society. Uh, but he goes on. Paul goes on here in chapter 4 of Colossians, verse 2. Devote yourselves to prayer. Devote yourselves to prayer. Uh, I think probably God's people would agree 
uh, in every age that prayer is perhaps the most difficult of the disciplines uh, to, to carry out and to make a part of our lives. Uh, we may fall asleep, especially at the end of a long day. Jesus' closest disciples and friends fell asleep in Jesus' presence on the mountain. Luke 9, 32. Uh, you know, perhaps it was a tiring climb and they were not in the greatest of shape. Um, this, of course, is supposing that scripture doesn't say that. Um, not until they were awake did they see God's glory. And then again, on another occasion, um, Peter, James, and John all fell asleep in the Garden of Gethsemane in spite of Jesus asking them to watch with him. Stay awake is the force of the word watch there. Stay awake. Um, so we can just physically give out in the context of trying to pray. Uh, or we may be mentally distracted, especially when we don't really expect our prayers to make much difference. Uh, the remedy for that goes back to uh, many places, but the Psalms, and one Psalm in particular has caught my eye in the past, Psalm 5, verses 1 through 3. Think about this matter of expectation in our praying. Do we really think it's going to make any difference? Well, in Psalm 5, verse 1, we have these words. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my sighing. Listen to my cry for help, my King and my God. For to you I pray. In the morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my request before you and wait in expectation. So there it is. Uh, what do we expect when we pray? Uh, maybe we don't expect very much, and therefore other things grab our intention, attention. Uh, we may forget to be grateful in our praying. Paul, again, in that uh, well of passage in Philippians, uh, where he admonishes his people not to be anxious about anything, uh, then on the positive side says, but by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. And so we are to be thankful. If nothing else, we can be thankful that we have the ear of the master of the universe. Amazing. God hears us from the get-go. And then these things happen to all of us, even Paul. So Paul pleads with the believers there, Pray for us too, he pleads. Chapter 4, verse 3, back in Colossians. Chapter 4, verse 3. And pray for us too, Paul writes. Uh, all right. Um, I think we need to keep in mind that in the final analysis, God is the evangelist. He is the one that does the evangelizing through the Holy Spirit. We are born again. Paul calls for their prayers for him to depend on God to make things happen. And so he says, pray for us too, that God may open a door. Uh, we cannot force anything uh, of, of good, any obedience whatsoever. We cannot force that on some other person. We cannot make it happen in our lives, in our relationships. It's something that uh, the Lord must give to us, and so we ask him. Paul calls for their prayers to depend on God to make things happen. And Paul calls for prayer for himself that he will work for clarity. Where do we get that? Verse 4, right? Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. It refers to the mystery of Christ, that is, 
that Christ would come, Christ would live, he would die, he would rise again. Uh, the mystery of uh, Christ himself, the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, the one through whom creation uh, was created, this great one, fully man, tempted in every way as we are, yet without sinning. Uh, this is, is the one uh, we are to proclaim clearly. And that's what Paul is saying. So uh, that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am changed. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. It's just only obvious. Notice too, he wants prayer to carry out his calling not for his needs. So he wants clarity as he uh, speaks to people, as he interacts with all kinds of people, including uh, prison keepers, guards. Um, he wants prayer for calling out, uh, carrying out his calling. All right. Paul gives the believers in Colossae some final pointers regarding witnesses in the same chapter in this paragraph, really. Colossians 4, verse 5. So, uh, here we are, gathered around this table, some of us, and other tables, the rest of you. Um, and what is our charge here? What is our great calling? We, along with Paul, are to be wise in the way we act toward outsiders. Don't parade your spirituality or knowledge. Have some wisdom here. Don't force all your marvelous insights into life on every person that comes down the pike. Don't parade your spirituality. Don't be condescending or critical. Remember, Few people have ever been argued into the kingdom. St. Francis wisely suggests that people are to witness by their actions. They should use words only if they have to. You've heard that expression, I'm sure. So if you use words, Paul says, let your conversation be, verse 6, always full of grace seasoned with salt the gospel of jesus christ folks is not boring so our words with others should never be boring our words should be seasoned with salt okay so uh do we agree to this then the hebrew word for this agreement is what we say it at the end of every prayer that we offer to the Lord. Amen. Amen. Yeah. That's a great Hebrew word. Now you've just, this is the first word of Hebrew that you have learned. First of many words. Although you won't learn them from me probably. But amen. Amen. Um, all right. That's it for now. And I am going to close our study and then we'll have a time for questions and prayer but i'm going to close with these words from the prophet jeremiah <clears throat> the time is coming declares the lord when i will make a new covenant with the house of israel and with the house of judah it will not be like the covenant i made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. God's will, as we find it condensed in the Ten Commandments, but uh, further condensed in Jesus' uh, speech to the Pharisee who said, what are the greatest laws? And Jesus said, love the Lord your God 
with all your heart and mind and soul and strength and your neighbor as yourself, I will put my law in their minds, the law of love ultimately, and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Let's pray and give thanks. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for uh, the love in your heart that stands behind your word. The reason for giving us your word and warning us to be guided by it with the help of your spirit. We ask your blessing on these words that we have thought about from your word this morning. Will you bless us as we open ourselves to your word and seek to uh, honor you by living by them. In the name of your son, amen. All right. Um, what are some of the questions and comments you might have on the basis of God's word? Well, good. Paul? Bill? Bill, you're on. I just said, well done. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> thank you. I was going to say, um, you know, thank you for taking on one of the most like, controversial, <laughs> most controversial <laughs> passages. It is. It's loathed by feminists. Um, so I'm, I'm just misunderstood like, by feminists. <laughs> all right. I, I mean, I like, I love your explanation. And God, God is a God of order. Uh, and this is part of his order. Um, there, there are other passages uh, that Paul has written, like the ones in First Timothy, that I think are even uh, more controversial. And, and I'll just, uh, just read from First Timothy chapter 2. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She must be silent. So, I mean, one explanation for why he's writing this, so sounding so stern, is that there was a problem with the church in Ephesus that were related to some women that were false teachers. Hmm. But it's not, not always so obvious going whether the context is a general context or a specific context. So, I mean, I kind of, I kind of like that commentary about this passage, but I'm just throwing that out there for maybe your comment. Well, yes, it, it's not contradictory. It's the uh, word there, full submission, uh, is, is not this word obey in the Greek. Um, I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She must be silent. All right, that's the, the verse. Those are the words that constitute the rub here. What, what is Paul really saying? Being silent seems to be pretty clear just not to say anything um, and and I think you perhaps have pointed in the direction of how to understand this Paul uh, in your comments but it does certainly um, have to do with an implied breach of uh, morals, really, in uh, not giving due respect to the authority or authorities that are there in the church. I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She must be sent. Well, I mean, uh, coming from a guy. Age. Christians have, have said, well, what about women on the mission field uh, who are teaching all the time and speaking all the time and leading in worship? 
Uh, is that wrong? Well, there have been some um, mission groups that have taken the position that women are not to serve as authoritatively as men do on the mission field, uh, no more than they would at home in, in their home church. Uh, it, it just does not seem, and this is one of these places where the scripture is to be compared uh, with other scripture when you come across a, a portion of scripture that's difficult to understand and try to consult with other passages that uh, speak more clearly. And uh, certainly, though it seems clear, must be silent, no teaching. Uh, the exhortation for all to lift up holy hands in prayer, men and women, uh, women are to be those who, who pray, not just privately, but also in the context of the church. Uh, Paul does not preclude women from speaking in tongues, as long as there is an interpreter. That's the only uh, restriction that Paul places on the speaking of tongues on the part of people in the church uh, is that they uh, make sure that the content of their tongue speaking is something that is not leaving unbelievers who happen to be worshiping in that church uh, in, in the dark. Uh, the speech, the tongues, uh, the teaching, whatever verbal expressions there are, are to honor the Lord, first of all, of course, and then also are to be of benefit to those who are just dropping in for that Sunday's service. Uh, those who are newcomers, perhaps. Those who may not be believers. Uh, not that those who happen to come to church uh, are all unbelievers, not by any means. Uh, but it's the mentality of really caring about the other people in the service that is part of what is governing Paul uh, in these uh, concerns that he expresses. Well, that's kind of a long answer, which says to me, if not all of you, that uh, it's still something of uh, a quandary. I don't use the word mystery because mystery in the scripture is something known to God in only in one period, but then made known to his people in another period. Uh, but it, it certainly is perplexing these passages. Anybody else like to comment on uh, this, this issue? What does it mean for uh, a woman to have this special kind of uh, warning, I suppose you could say, uh, about their conduct in the church? Yes. Uh, in the King James, um, part of 12 says, um, but I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority. That's a totally different story when you are usurping someone's uh, leadership. Mm -hmm. the, the idea of usurping is, is um, somebody who's trying to take over. Right. And, and they don't have the authority mm -hmm. to do that. That's already, though, implied in that passage I alluded to in Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, where God speaks to the woman and says, uh, your desire shall be for uh, your husband. And what was the rest of it? Your desire shall be for your husband and he will rule over you. I don't think that was probably good news to Eve. Uh, I think she would have struggled with that. 
he will rule over you. And she might have said to herself, well, that's the problem already. Um, but it seems uh, there from God's remedy for the situation, as he's speaking to Adam and Eve and the serpent there in the garden, uh, it seems that God is uh, saying, now there is this tendency, and you will not enjoy it any more than man would enjoy tilling the field with thorns in it. Um, this is a kind of punishment in a way. But you have to be careful here because Adam was already the head of his wife in chapter 2 before the fall. Uh, and his wife was to be his helper. Now, again, some scholars have pointed out that the word helper there is a word used of God, who is our help. Um, he is our helper. And so it certainly isn't uh, an inferior kind of assignment that the woman has here, because she is uh, really in the company of God, who is our final helper. So there is that nuance of headship uh, where man is head over the garden also. That's part of his uh, authority, is naming all these uh, animals that are in the garden in, in the world. Uh, so there is that special responsibility of stewardship that the man has, and the woman is to assist him in that because he needs all the help he can get. Some have said, and some of us have experienced. So um, th there is an ambiguity there, but certainly part of what God is saying to the woman is uh, you are going to be struggling. Uh, and recognize it. You'll be struggling with the authority uh, of your husband. Now, I have to be careful here. The <laughs> woman is not to be uh, subject in the same way to all men. It's only to her husband. And the husband has this calling uh, to cherish his wife in a very special and unique way. He leaves his mother and his father clings to his wife. They are one flesh, which implies a sexual relationship, certainly as part of it. And uh, because of this, uh, man's relationship to his wife is unique, as hers is to him. Some of my notes here... Uh, Somebody else, yes, Bill. Some, some of my notes here uh, refer to the culture at the time that Paul was talking to the Ephesians that women weren't allowed to read or to uh, study. Um, so these new Christians probably were <laughs> women were not educated, um, you know, the way they, they needed to be. And they needed to study the word and learn the word and grow in the word, but they weren't ready to preach the word. I mean, because they didn't have the background. So he was maybe aiming specifically at the Ephesian women who, you know, didn't have that background to, to move up through it. And he, he doesn't, I mean, he later on calls a lot of people, especially, you know, Timothy's mother and grandmother and uh, BB and, you know, all the other workers with him in Christ. So he was, and they'd been taught and they'd learned you know, up through. So he was really specifically talking to these people who had no background knowledge. And yeah, well, it, it certainly, excuse me, it certainly is true that uh, the Jewish um, culture and the Jewish worship uh, did not have a place for the woman that the man had. The male priests were the ones who led. The male priests uh, and the scribes were the ones who taught the people uh, specifically. 
so that it was a whole new situation here with the coming of Christ and the coming of the Holy Spirit, especially. Uh, that uh, it was, I suppose I can use the phrase, a new ball game. Uh, there was a newness about it. We read from Jeremiah that there was to be a new covenant. Uh, this new covenant was uh, uh, distinguished by the law of God, loving neighbor and God, uh, the law of God being written on their hearts. This was a new thing. Uh, so that the Holy Spirit living in his people, whether individually as believers or corporately as a church that was new completely new so there was a new situation here and it's not unreasonable to suppose that there were uh, various experiments uh, taking place in the context of worship which may well have included women taking uh, some kind of responsibility and some kind of uh, leadership role. And maybe this was being abused. All of this is not unlikely, unreasonable. Uh, but we, we have to leave it there and not uh, make more of that than should be. There nevertheless seems to be on the part of Paul, he's writing to a leader in the church, Timothy, uh, giving Timothy some guidance in terms of some problems that were there uh, in the church, uh, over which Timothy had some responsibility. Other, um, this is helpful, uh, appreciate that. Uh, perspective because it is part of what we need to contend with in any attempt to understand the scripture in the context of what it meant to the people in that day that's a uh, first order of business as we study the bible and try to understand it well what did these words mean to those people to whom they were addressed that's where we start and that does include the matter of uh, the culture and the cultural influence on those people. Uh, so, yeah, thanks for that perspective. Any other comments, questions? Okay, um, maybe then it's time for uh, some prayer. You're still recording. I'm sorry. You're still recording. We don't usually record. Oh, good gift. yeah. Thank you, Yvonne. That's coming from the big M, huh? Yes. Pardon? <laughs> Do you want to go down in history with that comment, Bill? Not <laughs> with Marjorie a little. While we're waiting to be closed down, uh, you've noticed that we have the sparrow once again uh, here as part of the class. Here it is. It's, it's nestled down here on the Bible. That's good. That's a good sign. Uh, 